right, thank you very much for joining us today. Continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series. Today, we are pleased to present John Smith. John is the Assistant Archivist at the Chester County Archives in West Chester, Pennsylvania. He joined the team in 2018 after graduating from Temple University in Philadelphia with a master's degree in public history. He's been researching and writing about Chester County history since moving to the area in 2012 as an undergraduate at the local Westchester University. In the archives, you'll find John staffing the reference desk in the public research room, answering phone calls and emails from researchers, as well as working on different educational projects like research reports, blog posts, social media content, videos, and mapping projects. Today, he's going to cover the Chester County. Uh, he's going to introduce you to the Chester County, which was one of three original counties formed by William Penn in 1682. Attracted by Penn's promise of religious freedom, the abundance of fertile land, and its close proximity to major cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore, many families can trace their ancestral origins back to this area in the southeastern Pennsylvania. This lecture will highlight some local history to get a glimpse into the world inhabited by earlier generations of Chester Countyans. <laughs> I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, we will also review the most popular collections at the Chester County Archives and discuss how these collections are quite representative of similar institutions across the Commonwealth. While the conversation will be structured around Chester County and its historic resources, it will also offer general approaches to genealogical research in the broader southeastern Pennsylvania region. So I'd like to extend a warm virtual welcome to John. Cool. Well, thank you, Sue. I really appreciate that introduction. And to um, address it right away, yes, my name is John Smith. So we can all appreciate, right, those very generic names of our ancestors, right? We have the Evan Evansons or the William Williamsons. So next time you think about complaining about the names of your ancestors, you just remember you could be a John Smith in 2021. Um, so yes, I, I recognize the name is um, quite uncommon today in 2021. Um, but I really, I really appreciate the invitation to speak today, Sue. Um, I will admit it was a bit odd at first thinking about presenting to a community college in Nevada, right? Because when I think of a county archive, I, I think about the community, right? I'm very ingrained in the historical landscape of the Chester County community, but I think as we're seeing here today, right, everyone's not from the Nevada area. Um, that just goes to show that genealogy research, historical research isn't conf confined to a geographic area anymore, right? So I've even seen messages from um, individuals already. Um, I heard one gentleman, Mark, you mentioned you have ancestors from, from the Pennsylvania area. So it's just like ge um, geography or geographic lines don't define communities anymore. So. Um, even though you might not be physically in Chester County, a lot of you could probably trace your ancestors back to this area. So I think it's really cool uh, to get this opportunity to speak with everyone today. Um, and I do want to just up front um, at the very beginning, because I know, you know, a lot can be said throughout a presentation. Very first up front, I just want to let you all know that if you do have questions or if you have ancestors from Chester County, you want to do a little bit of research here, our website is going to be chesco.org slash archives. This is where you're going to find um, our indexes, our guides, our finding aids. Um, there's a helpful links section. Um, so if you want to access some historic deeds, you can find them under helpful links. If you're looking for maps of the area, they'll be under there as well. Most importantly, our email address is going to be right there. So if you have any questions, you know, about local history, about something I've said, or I will say in this presentation, um, questions about uh, genealogy, feel free to send us an email and we'll be happy to help out. I should also preface at the very beginning of this, I am by no means um, an, a genealogist. Uh, there's going to be many, most of you, I would say the overwhelming majority of you in this room will have much more experience doing genealogical research than I do. So if you come um, email us, you know, a really big a difficult genealogical question, we probably won't be able to be the ones to answer the, that question, but we have enough genealogical or genealogist researchers coming into our research room that we'll be able to point you in the right directions to, to see if, um, you know, we can find you the resources to use, or if we can't help you find the resources, at least um, direct you to the, the professional genealogist in this area who, who's more familiar with researching uh, these topics. Um, if you're from Chester County, it might be, you know, it might be a little silly to see um, me include these maps, but I'm very 
ge uh, geographic oriented. I need to know, you know, where the the place is that we're talking about. So for those of you who don't know, Chester County, we are in the very southeastern part of the state of Pennsylvania, right outside of the Philadelphia area. We're about 45 minutes west of Philadelphia. Um, so you'll see uh, where we are in comparison to the rest of the state, as well as what our um, county outline looks like today. And understanding Chester County's um, borders is really important uh, to understand doing genealogical research in this area. For example, Lancaster County, that was a part of Chester County until 1729. So if you have ancestors from the Lancaster area before 1729, you're not going to find a Lancaster County record for them, you know, pre-1729. It's going to be in Chester County. Same thing with Delaware County. It formed out of Chester County in 1789. I realized this after I included this, this little chart um, in my presentation, I realized it still has the wedge down here. So you see this corner between Delaware, Maryland, and Chester County. There's this odd wedge. Um, basically, this was a very disputed area until about 1920. That's when the Federal Congress basically dis or settled the dispute, um, but it, it's that shouldn't that does not that area is not included in modern day Chester County. Uh, but this map is from 1880. Generally speaking, 1880 is when you get the modern uh, map of Chester County. Um, so uh, first, I just want to explain a little bit about the Chester County archives, a little bit about our history. Then I thought I'd go into a very quick and brief overview of the history of Chester County and southeastern PA. Um, so again, I'm not a genealogist, but I, I would consider myself a historian. So that's why I'm always, anytime there's a genealogist who comes into our, our research room, that is something I try to emphasize. I try to emphasize, you know, names and dates. They're the, they're the foundation of genealogy research, but it's also important to know the time period, right? What was happening during the time? What was the political landscape life like? What was the, you know, geography life? So I want to set the scene before we get into some of our records here at the archives. But the Chester County Archives, we were founded in 1982, and it's actually a really interesting relationship we have with our local historical society. Um, it was called the Chester County Historical Society up until about a year ago. Now they're known as the Chester County History Center. Uh, but basically in 1982, the county government of Chester County, they recognized they had all these really old valuable historic records. A lot of them we're, we're going to highlight later today. But they recognized they did not have the, the knowledge or the expertise to take care, to take care of these records, to preserve them, to make them accessible to researchers like yourself. So the county government went to the historical society. They said, hey, can you basically help us take care of these historic records? That's when this partnership formed. Um, I'm working currently, I'm working in the county government, but I actually am employed by the History Center. So basically the History Center, they employ uh, the staff, the, the trained historians, the archivists to take care of these county records, which is really a benefit to researchers in the Chester County area. Because not only do you know, I know the records in the Chester County archives, but because I'm employed by the History Center, I'm also aware of the, the collections at the Historical Society. So just the division, county archives, we have your government records like taxes, deeds, court cases, um, estate papers. Uh, the county government was formed in 1682. So we have all those county governments from 1682 to about the mid 20th century. The History Center, they're going to have your uh, private collections, right? Your family papers, scrapbooks, letters, photographs, newspaper clippings, Bibles, church records things like that. So if you're doing any type of research in Chester County, um, like chances are you're going to be able to use both of these collections. Um, so if you come by the archives one day, we're probably going to suggest a collection for you to look at over at the History Center and vice versa. If you're at the History Center, they're going to recommend coming over to us. So this is really useful and interesting relationship we have here in Chester County. Um, but I don't, not only do we have the local History Center, but we are within an hour drive of, you know, countless of other research institutions, right? So you have other county archives, um, you have other, you know, local historical societies within the townships here in Chester County. In Pennsylvania, we have a great state archives out in Harrisburg, and we also have the Pennsylvania, or excuse me, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. 
If you have Quaker ancestors, right, we're right down the street from the uh, Friends Historical Library at Swarthmore College, Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia. Um, so this is a really good and convenient place to do any type of genealogy research because you're really not more than an hour drive from all these different research institutions. Um, so again, a lot of our families can be traced back to this area. And if you do, you know, wander down that rabbit hole and you, you kind of start exploring this area, uh, you're going to have a lot, of, you should have a lot of documentation um, not that far away. Um, so yeah, just again, a little bit about the, the history of the southeastern Pennsylvania area, because I know, you know, it's obviously associated with William Penn and the Quakers, um, but I thought we could just discuss that a little bit more. Um, obviously, before any Europeans were in this area, this was um, the area settled by the Len the Lenape people, the indigenous group called the Lenape, uh, they were here for thousands of years. Some people said they were here for 10,000 years before the first Europeans ever settled here. Um, the first Europeans who came here uh, were not the English, actually, it, were, it was the Swedes, right? They were part of the new Sweden colony. Um, and in Sweden included parts of modern day Finland and Russia and Germany and the Baltic states. So it was a really diverse area. Um, many people are surprised to learn the Swedes had a colonial empire, but this was during the Thirty Years' War, right? The, the Swedes wanted an advantage, so they thought they could come out here to North America and establish a fur uh, trading colony. Um, but unfortunately, it just never really took hold. Um, they were quickly replaced by the Dutch, right? So we know about New York. Before New York was New York, it was New Amsterdam. Um, and, and this area, Pennsylvania, was just an extension of New Amsterdam. Um, eventually, the English came in. They replaced the Dutch um, in 1664. And this area was, before it was Pennsylvania, it was just, again, an extension of New York. It was under the authority of the Duke of York. But then William Penn, um, he, got, he got his land charter from King Charles II. King Charles II was very close with William Penn's father, who was an admiral in the Navy, um, and Admiral Penn was a very um, big proponent of the king, and he, he helped him out during the Glorious Revolution. So the Penn family had a debt. The, the, the monarch, or English monarch owed the Penn family a substantial debt. William Penn Jr., so the William Penn, he was a Quaker. Um, they were considered radicals over in England. Um, they were constantly getting in trouble. Um, William Penn was imprisoned a few times. So the King of England, he thought, well, I owe this guy a bunch of money. I owe him a debt. Um, he's a leader of this radical group. Why don't we just give him land over in North America? Because that's how Pennsylvania, well, what he did was he divided it into three counties. You're going to have Bucks County, Philadelphia County, and Chester County. Um, so in 1682, that is when um, Chester County, the government formed. So again, Chester County, this area has a very long and diverse history. But when we talk about the county of Chester, that's an English government. Our history starts in 1682. Um, this is what Chester County looked like in 1690. Basically, the borders were very fluid. Basically, William Penn got everything west of the Delaware River, north of Maryland, and east of the Susquehanna River um, out in the west. So it was a very, you know, not very well defined area, but most of the population was still. Uh, residing near the Delaware River. Uh, 1730, you see the area starting to expand further and further west. This is when you see Lancaster County forms. You see down here, there's that famous land dispute between the Penn family and uh, the Calvert family in Maryland, They're, them being uh, Catholics, Penn being a Quaker. There was this land dispute um, that wasn't solved until 1760 with the Mason-Dixon line, right? Um, so you see these things called the Nottingham lots. Basically, William Penn was giving these huge land grants down in this area to get Quakers to settle and move in to replace the Catholic families. Um, so that's another important thing, right? If you're doing any type of research and you know your family was located in this southern part of Chester County, it's gonna be really worthwhile also checking Cecil County, Maryland, which is this Maryland down here uh, or this county down there in Maryland, because um, it was this very fluid border. Some people were filing their paperwork in the Chester County area. Others were filing it in the Maryland area. Um, 1790, um, 
the, the, the population of Chester County expanded so far to the north and west, we basically moved our county seat, which was historically in the city of Chester. We moved it to where we are today in Westchester. But the folks down in Delaware County, they weren't happy with that. So they split off and formed their own county. So again, maybe people have um, family from the Chester area. It's really frustrating explaining to them Chester, the city of Chester was once in Chester County, but today is in Delaware County, which is in Pennsylvania, not the state of Delaware. It's a very confusing naming system. Um, I have to explain that about once a week, um, but um, it's just part of the history. So just being aware of the borders, the changing names or the changing borders um, will really help in any type of research. And this is a map, you just see the type of people coming to this area, right? The main part of the county, um, are gonna be English Quakers. They were attracted uh, by the idea of, you know, this religious freedom offered by William Penn uh, and this really fertile land, like we said in the introduction. Um, in the Southern part of the county, you're gonna have a lot of Scots-Irish. Um, this complicates matters again, because I remember I told you um, a lot of people in the Southern part of the county were recording their stuff in Chester, some were doing it in Maryland. Um, you have to also keep in mind this southern part of the county is very far away from the county seat here in Chester and where we are today in West Chester. That's a far, far ride. Um, so if people had a deed or um, a will or something, they weren't go necessarily going to the county seats to have uh, this paperwork filed. So distance is another contributing factor, but also culture, right? The, the Scots-Irish, they were traditionally very uneasy with government. They didn't like having uh, the county government involved with their land transactions or their settling of their uh, de deceased loved ones' affairs. So generally, they weren't recording that information. So if you, again, if you're doing um, any type of research in the southern part of the county, um, you're going to hit frustrations just because, again, geography, distance, um, the politics of the border, and culture. You also see in the area of Chester, it was predominantly settled by the Swedes, right? The Swedes, this was, when William Penn came, he landed in the area of Chester. He didn't land in Philadelphia. Uh, he wanted to settle in Chester, but the Swedes had already purchased the land. A lot of it was already purchased in Swedish families. Uh, so that's when he moved up to Philadelphia because it was basically this blank landscape for him to start, start fresh. Um, so you see the Swedes will still have a um, a presence there throughout the you know, early 19th century. Um, and again, just a very quick overview. Chester County's history is very for reflective of broader national trends, right? At first, we were a colonial frontier. People are surprised to learn that we were considered the frontier at one point, right? The frontier is considered out west in Ohio and Texas and, and Nevada, right? That was the frontier. But for a long time, for about a century, this was the frontier. Uh, this is one of our earliest records. It's um, the county treasurer and it's recording. Basically the county commissioners issued um, or started this pr program uh, where they wanted to basically get rid of all the wolves in this area. They wanted to get rid of the foxes and get rid of the crows for people to settle here. So there was this program where if you brought the commissioners a wolf's head or a fox head, you would get paid. So it was just a way to get rid of all these predators. And you see Indians, Native Americans were taking advantage of this program. Uh, so this is one of the few records we have where you see indigenous people mentioned in the records. Because again, we are an English government and we preserve records from the county government. So we're not gonna have many records from the, the Lenape people, uh, but this is one of the few records where you do see uh, Native Americans mentioned and taking, taking advantage of this program uh, to clear the areas of uh, the predators. Chester County was a very uh, agricultural um, economy, right? Um, so in Virginia, right, you have the, the tobacco, the southern colonies, you have cotton. Chester County, the middle colonies was all about wheat. Um, a lot of wheat was produced here. You would take the wheat and take it to a local grist mill where they would grind it up. They would take that grist mill and turn it into flour. And that flour was then exported to the Caribbean. Uh, the Caribbean, the, right, Haiti, Dominican Republic, huge slave populations, incredibly big slave, slave plantations. They couldn't feed them there in the Caribbean, so they had to re rely on flour and wheat from the colonies. Chester County single-handedly fed uh, these large 
um, enslaved populations in the South. So even though, you know, Chester County has a good reputation with abolition, emancipation, Quakers were very supportive of the idea of abolition, our economy single-handedly, you know, contributed to um, slavery, right? Uh, but not only did, you know, grist mills and flour um, help with the economy, but also when you're taking these, these exports to the local market, to Philadelphia, to Newcastle, you have a lot of taverns, right? Chester County, Outside of Chester, there was not a major city in Chester County until after the Revolutionary War. Your major areas of population would have been these villages where taverns were, right? People are going to Philadelphia. They're going to Newcastle to sell their flour. They needed a place to stay, so they would stop at the local tavern. Uh, that's how Westchester started. We, we had a tavern here called the Turk's Head. That's how uh, a population was attracted to this area. Later 19th century, this is when industrialization happens. Uh, industrialization, immigration, you have these, um, the populations migrating to places like Westchester, like Coatesville, like Phoenixville to work in the steel mills. Um, that pattern continued until after World War II. Today we're a su suburb, right? We are a suburb of Philadelphia. You're going to see a lot of communities, a lot of row homes. Uh, we have a really great initiative though, where it's called Open Space, where we're trying to preserve some of that green space uh, so you see a lot of communities like this, you know, a lot of packed, dense housing surrounded by really green and open space. Um, so even though we're very populated and um, densely populated now, um, our history is not that, that far removed from where we are today. Um, so I know that was a very quick overview, but again, I always try to recommend people just get a sense of what's happening in the area. Um, just so you know, you know, what your ancestors would have been going through at the time. Again, names and dates, they're really important. But if you see your ancestor moved to Chester County during this time period, and then they left in this time period, well, what, what might have caused those, those moves? What would have caused those transitions? Um, so again, we preserve government records. Government records are mandated by state law. So the records we preserve here at the Chester County Archives are all being dictated by what the law is coming out of Harrisburg. So regardless of whether you're researching in Chester County or Lancaster or Philadelphia or Cumberland County, every county should have pretty similar type records, right? They might not be in a county archive. They might still be with the individual departments, but you should be able to find similar records no matter where you're researching in Pennsylvania. Um, so I know, for example, Berks County, which is just north of us, they don't have a county archive. If you want deeds, you're gonna to have to go to the recorder of deeds office. If you want taxes, you're gonna to have to go to the assessment office. Um, fortunately, Berks County is pretty good. They have a lot of indexes available. Um, but again, it's just this idea of if you find it here in Chester County, you should be able to find it somewhere in other counties. Uh, but that's talking about, again, government records. Um, so yeah, let's take, we can start looking at uh, some of these specific records we have here uh, in the Chester County Archives. Uh, we have to dis disappoint up a lot of people quite often. Um, actually about 15 minutes before I jumped on this presentation, someone, a researcher called asking for a birth record from 1820. Unfortunately in Pennsylvania, county governments just were not responsible for, for recording vital information. And when I say vital information, right, I mean births, deaths and marriages. Um, there were very short windows of time in the late 19th century when the state tried to enforce counties take recording information like this. Uh, but anything before the late 19th century, you're going to have to go to um, religious records, right? Typically, that information would have been recorded with an individual's local church or local meeting house. Um, so I always recommend people first identify, can you identify what your ancestors' religious belief was? Were they Quakers? Were they Presbyterians? Were they Baptists? Were they Catholic? Secondly, can you identify what happened to those records? Um, again, luckily, Quaker records, we know they're with the Friends Historical Library. Presbyterians, we know there's the Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia. Baptists, Baptists were notoriously bad record keepers, so it's hard to keep track of Baptist church records. Uh, but if they exist, they would probably be with local uh, private historical societies like the Chester County History Center, for example. But unfortunately, you won't find any government issued 
uh, Pennsylvania vital records uh, before the late 19th century. And you see they're, they're very short windows of time too, right? 1852 to 1855, counties were just not following through with this practice. But again, people, if someone had a child, they had to go to the county seat to have this information Record it. And you can imagine people in the southern part or the northern part weren't planning to make a whole day's trip to the county seat just to let the county government know, hey, I had a kid or hey, this person died. Um, the county tried or the state tried again in 1893 to 1906. This one's a little bit more thorough, um, but again, it's just not complete. So a lot of people come to me, they say, hey, I know my ancestor was born 1898. There should be a record of him in your birth um, index or your death index. And it's just, it, it wasn't complete. This doesn't record every single birth or every th single death. Um, so in 1906, that's when you see the state government takes over. Uh, so now if anyone wants a birth record or a death record after 1906, we have to direct them to the Pennsylvania state government. <clears throat> uh, but luckily there's you know, quite a few alternatives, um, right? You have your, those religious records, tax records are great in Pennsylvania. We know, um, only men older than 21 pay taxes. Uh, so if you can identify the first year your male ancestor paid a tax, then you can subtract about 21 years and you can get a rough estimate of their birth year. Um, marriage records are pretty unique. Again, it has that short window of time in the late 19th century. Um, starting in 1885 though, that's when the county government started recording this information for legal purposes and they did a pretty, pretty accurate job. Um, Unfortunately, there was no law making people marry in one specific county, like their county of residence or anything. So if people think uh, their ancestors might have been married in Chester County, but they don't find a record here, we recommend them going, trying a few neighboring counties, um, especially Cecil County, Maryland, because you'll find in New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, if um, a couple was younger than 21 years old, their parents had to give consent to the marriage. Uh, in Maryland, there was no, or you had, you only had to be 16 years old to get uh, married. There was no uh, parental consent. So if you had these 18 year olds who wanted to get married without their parents' consent, they would go to Cecil County, Maryland to get married. Uh, you see that quite a bit. Um, it's almost like the Las Vegas <clears throat> in the East. Uh, people just going, young people going to Maryland, Cecil County, Maryland to get married. <clears throat> Uh, with our marriage records, um, they're not marriage certificates. That's what we have to keep telling people. They are marriage applications and returns. Basically, a couple would receive their marriage certificate, and we, the county, would hang on to the application. Uh, anytime a couple was married, they were supposed to re have a return sent back to the county. So if we have a return, we know a marriage went through. If we only have an application, there's no you know, legal way we can prove uh, the, the couple was marry, married. Um, but if you're just doing genealogy, genealogical research, the application is going to have a really, you know, a lot of useful information. Um, and here's, here's, you know, a typical example of those birth and death registers. Again, remember 1893 to 1906, and they're not death records or birth records or certificates, I should say. They're just registers. So you're going to have one name on a page with, you know, about 20 other individuals. We have all these um, records indexed on our website, which you can go to right now. And most of this information is going to be included, included in the index. Um, I think like occupation of father is one of the categories we didn't index. Um, so it's always beneficial to view the original source, obviously, uh, but a lot of the information was carried over into our indexes. Naturalization papers, um, a lot Naturalization was a federal process, so there's going to be no surprises here. Um, the type of naturalization papers we have, earliest ones starting in 1798, going through about 1989. Um, unfortunately, naturalization didn't just occur in county courts. They also went to state courts and federal courts. So even though someone might have lived in Chester County, does not necessarily mean they were naturalized in Chester County. Uh, these, these graphs kind of just show naturalization, naturalization trends throughout the county's history. Uh, early 19th century, predominantly Irish coming over here. Then you see um, later, it's the Italians, the, the Hungarians. Uh, and today we have a really big uh, Southeastern Asian 
presence um, in the county. Uh, so it's just interesting to see the different um, origins or nationalities of people coming over here to Chester County clearly changing over the years. Tax records, uh, again, this is no surprise, but we're really, we, we think our tax records are pretty unique because uh, of how expansive they are. Our earliest tax records start in 1715 and they grow through 1939. Um, and I would say probably about 95% of our 18th century taxes have been indexed. Um, so that's where if you have any ancestor who, who lived in this area for even a short amount of time, we might not have a will, we might not have a deed, we might not have any court papers for them, but we should at least have the tax records. Uh, tax records are great because they're almost like an annual census for taxable individuals. Like, so again, if you know you had an ancestor in this area, it's worth poking around the tax records to see, okay, what township were they in? Then if you can identify a township they were in, then it might be worthwhile uh, looking at their neighbors, right? Were their neighbors filing wills? Were they recording deeds? Because then your ancestor might be a witness to a deed, or they might be, you know, an administrator to um, an estate. Um, our 19th century taxes, we have a bunch indexed as well. Um, not every single one, but uh, we, we kind of, we try to space them out. Uh, so, you know, if you see an ancestor in Chester County in 1820, but not 1824, then you can start looking at those individual years uh, to see when they might have moved. Um, and I have a few examples on this next slide. Um, you see 1715 taxes, they're gonna be your tax rate. Unfortunately, we don't have any tax assessments before 1765. So all of our tax records from 1715 to 1765 are just gonna be a list of names and the rates of uh, their tax rate. So what they paid in, in taxes. Still really useful because again, we know if they're paying taxes, they're gonna be at least 21 years old. Um, your county assessments, that's what you see in the center there. That's when you're going to see uh, a detailed description of their property. You're also going to see, um, you know, their occupations. If they weren't a, a farmer or if they weren't a yeoman, if they had a trade, they're going to pay a tax on that trade. Because even though we think of the uh, the income tax as a, tw a 20th century phenomenon, uh, Pennsylvanians were paying a tax on their on their trade on their occupation um, in the early 1700s. Um, and also, if, if, they, if they were a single man, so if they weren't married, they were paying a tax. So people could have been taxed as much as three times, right? One for their property, uh, once for their occupation, and once, you know, if they were single. Uh, 20th century taxes, they're probably the most, uh, the, the least detailed, I should say. Not that much information, but if you have an ancestor who lived in a borough in the 20th century, so Westchester, Coatesville, Phoenixville, Kennett Square, these taxes are going to give you a street address, which is really nice. Uh, we like that with census records uh, in these early 20th century records for the boroughs, we get addresses as well. So that's really convenient. Um, tax records, I consider them the Swiss army knife of archival records because you can apply them in so many different ways. They're really, really uh, expendable. But if you're going to get value out of them, you have to know state law. Um, for example, there's a term in Pennsylvania tax records, uh, inmates, people always tell me, oh man, my, my, my ancestor was uh, an inmate, uh, they were a prisoner. Uh, but in Pennsylvania, inmate means a man older than 21, again, he's taxable, he doesn't have land, so he's, he doesn't have property taxes, but he's married, so he's going to pay a lower tax rate than a free man. A free man, again, older than 21, he doesn't have property tax, but he's single. So he's gonna pay a higher tax than his married counterpart. So again, single men paid higher taxes and that was just the county or the, the state's way of discouraging you know, young single men from uh, you know, just being irresponsible. They wanted people to get married. They wanted people to start families, to settle down. Uh, that, and basically having a higher tax was the, the, the state government's way of discouraging uh, being single. Um, if you have uh, African-American ancestors in your family, you're not going to see them in the inmate or freeman category until the 1870s even. Uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, voting rights was basically tied to taxable status. 
So they didn't want, if you paid, if I as a white man paid a head tax as an inmate or a free man, I was considered taxable, right? Pennsylvanians, they didn't want uh, black men to get the right to vote. So they kept them out of these categories uh, to say they're not taxable, therefore they can't vote. In 1809, there was a dog tax, uh, a dog tax introduced. Black men had to pay the dog tax, uh, but that bas that's basically saying their dogs were taxable, not them themselves. Um, women, women traditionally didn't pay property taxes because uh, their property was basically, uh, basically the law understood their, their married husbands owned the property. So you're not going to see women in, in tax records, many women in tax records. Indentured servitude, right? Indentured servants weren't taxable until six months after the expiration of their contract. Uh, so if you know you have an ancestor who was an indentured servant, you're certainly not going to see them in the tax records during the time of their service. Um, so you're going to have to wait probably about until the next year to see them in the tax records. Um, and during the Revolutionary War, right? So uh, between 1776 and 1783, uh, there were state and federal supplies taxes. So basically the state government and the federal government were collecting revenue to defeat the British, right? For the war effort. So if you have an ancestor who paid taxes in Pennsylvania between 1776 and 1783, they, they literally helped secure American independence. Uh, we know the daughters of the American Revolution, a lot of people who apply uh, for membership, they're always coming to us trying to prove that they paid uh, the federal supplies tax. And we just tell them if they paid a tax between 76 and 83, they paid uh, a supplies tax and they, they helped um, with the war effort. You see, I have 1778 listed there. Um, that's just because that's the first uh, supplies tax during the war. We don't have taxes for 77 or 76. Uh, land records, that's really big um, in this area. Land was really important to William Penn's plan. Uh, basically, he, he developed a, a system where uh, he had to attract people to invest in this area. He had, in the, uh, he had to convince investors in England to buy land over here. So what he was doing, he was saying, if you buy 10 acres in Philadelphia, I'll give you a warrant. I think it was for 500 acres out in Chester County. So people were buying um, these plots in Philadelphia and sitting on these huge tracts of land out in Chester County. Uh, so understanding land records in this area is really important to understanding the history. Uh, and, and deeds, we have deeds. The earliest deed we have is from 1688. And we have them all the way through 1918. Everything after 1918 is still going to be with the recorder of deeds office. Uh, but luckily, since I think it was January of this year, you can access every single deed uh, in Chester County from 1688 through 2021 on the Recorder of Deeds website. You just need to go to their website uh, with the book and page number, and you can access all the historic deeds, um, which is great. Deeds are chock full of really useful biographical information. You're at the bare minimum, you're going to get the name of the people involved in the land transaction. You're going to, typically going to get where they're from, and you're going to get their occupation, which are just really big clues when you're doing genealogical research. Mm -hmm. And again, that's pretty standard for all counties in this area. Um, deeds are the backbone for, the, again, land is really important in this area. Uh, so whether they're with the county archives or still with the county departments, um, that's going to vary state or county by county, uh, but they're very um, visible in this area. Um, some people come to us ask, asking for um, that supposedly their, their ancestor received an original William Penn land grant. And that's an interesting statement because basically every, all land settled in Pennsylvania before 1776 was a Penn grant. Um, and William Penn did not single-handedly sell individuals pieces of the land. He represented the government, right? Just like in our state government is in Harrisburg, Penn in essence, was the proprietary government. He was the state government before 1776. And then, of course, his heirs or his sons after him. Uh, so people say they have a Penn grant. It's, it's cool, but it doesn't come directly from William Penn himself. And you see the land process uh, down there at the bottom. Someone first had to apply for 
a warrant. They received the warrant. Then someone went out there and surveyed the land. That's a survey you see on the screen there. Once it was surveyed, that's when you got the patent. Patent and grant are essentially one of the same things. Uh, once someone had a patent, that's when, and if they go to sell it, that's when uh, you get the county deeds. Uh, so anything earlier than deeds, they're still gonna be with the Pennsylvania State Archives out in Harrisburg. One of the really cool records we have here is the 1782 Book of British Depredations. Uh, so in 1782, the Revolutionary War was winding down. Representatives were meeting over in Paris to settle the, the war. They were making a peace treaty. And the colonies were responsible for basically compiling a list of damages the British caused during the war. Uh, the representatives who were meeting in Paris, they wanted these damage claims to kind of shame the British, saying, look at all the damage you caused, give us better peace terms. Uh, we still have that book of British depredations. Actually, it's at the, the Historical Society. Uh, but it's a, it's a great list. It shows you uh, all of the damages the British caused when they were marching through this area. Because you have to remember, again, we're, we're right outside of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the rebel capital. That's where the Second Continental Congress was meeting. The British wanted to capture Philadelphia. Uh, and as they were marching to capture Philadelphia, where were they marching? They were marching right here in Chester County. Um, so the, the Revolutionary War was a really uh, impactful event in this area. It, it, it's really important in this, the national or the, the memory in this local area. And uh, we actually just created this um, mapping project where we are trying to map every single property owner who would have been in Chester County in 1777. 1777 is the Battle of Brandywine, which is part of that Philadelphia campaign. And we are trying to map every property owner who would have been here to witness that devastation. Um, I, when I, we go to our website, I will show you that, uh, which is just won the National Genealogical Society Award. Um, we are one of three awards, so we're really proud of that. Uh, but again, it's such an important part of this county's history. Um, it shows, uh, it, it's good to have. It's a great resource for understanding this area's history. Of course, you know, Genealogists love probate records, right? We love wills, administration bonds, orphan, orphan's court proceedings. Uh, we, our earliest will in Chester County is from 1714. Uh, again, the county government we formed in 1682. So any will uh, written in Chester County between 1682 to 1714 is gonna be with the Philadelphia City Archives. Um, before 1714, all wills were being filed in Philadelphia, and that's where they remain to this day. Uh, 1714 is certainly not a hard year. You still see wills in Chester County being filed in Philadelphia, even up to the Revolutionary War. So if you know you have an ancestor in this area who filed a will, but you can't find it in our indexes, it's certainly worth your time going over and checking out the Philadelphia City Archives, because you see a lot of people um, a lot of Chester County residents living in Chester County, they were still filing their wills um, with the Philadelphia or with the government in Philadelphia. Um, will abstracts, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with them. Luckily in Chester County, we have will abstracts for our earliest will in 1714 all the way through 1855. That's about three quarters of all the wills in our collections have been indexed uh, or excuse me, abstracted. All of our wills have been indexed. So again, if you know you have a, an ancestor in Chester County, uh, you can use our index to look them up to find that will number. Um, Orphan's Court, I'm not sure if other states have Orphan's Court, but Orphan's Court has that weird uh, name. Orphans, we assume parentless, but traditionally that term orphan has just meant fatherless. Uh, Orphan's Court traditionally has just been an extension or a continuation of the probate process. Um, so someone died, they wrote a will, that will is there to settle the estate. Orphan's court proceedings are just an extension of that estate settlement. Uh, it's a real gold mine for genealogists because you're gonna get the names of most children. You're gonna get a lot of um, information about the land if they had land. Um, it's really an underutilized resource. I think one, because the name is a little confusing and a lot of the files are very thick. You're gonna have really thick Orphan's Court proceedings, 
and it's a bunch of legal language. Uh, so I think that's a little intimidating for some people, but if you just spend a little bit of time reading the orphans court proceedings, um, I think you're gonna be rewarded because there's a lot of really good genealogical clues in orphans court proceedings. Um, and then also minors estate. So if someone died with children who they left you know, property to, uh, but they were under 21, well then they had to file for a petition to have a guardian appointed to them. Because again, 21 was the, the legal age in Pennsylvania. So you didn't pay taxes before the age of 21, you didn't inherit property before the age of 21. Uh, everyone younger than 21 had to have a guardian appointed if they were gonna um, collect something from an estate and these minors estate, they're useful because again, you get the name of the individual, you're gonna get their age as well. Um, so really great resource there. Uh, but it's, all, it's really important to know that, you know, a lot overwhelming majority of families didn't have wills, right? We, to have a will or an estate settlement meant you had to have some type of value or wealth or property to necessitate a court proceeding, right? Most people would have died, they wouldn't have had much. So there would have been no reason to have you know, a really rigorous legal process. Uh, but that's luckily we have a lot of you know, records documenting the lives of poor individuals, right? Paupers. Um, 1798 is a really important year. 1798, there was a state law passed which uh, um, established the Chester County Poorhouse and the Lancaster County Poorhouse. Most counties around this area will also have poorhouses but they were established later on. And before county poorhouses were created, uh, the care and, and, and well-being of poor and pauper individuals were left to town, individual townships. Uh, so for example, in Chester County, in 1770, Chester County was not concerned with the well-being of paupers. It would have been, you know, West Goshen, um, West Nottingham. It would have been the individual townships. Um, unfortunately, Townships didn't really have a good record keeping system. So unfortunately, a lot of those records just don't exist. Over at the Chester County Historical Society, there are a few township um, dockets which document uh, expenses being paid to paupers, uh, expenses being paid to overseer of the poor, who were the rep local representatives who were going to make sure you know their neighbors had enough food to eat, enough firewood to stay warm. And things like that. So you're not going to see poor house records before 1798. Um, but these are really great books or records. You're going to have your admissions book. So anytime someone entered the poor house, there's going to be a description of them. Anytime they left the poor house, you're also going to, get, going to get note of that. There's account books. So even though maybe your ancestor wasn't in the poor house, um, maybe they supplied the poor house with milk, or maybe they supplied it with wood. Um, these are really well-documented records. You can basically recreate the entire social history of the Chester County Poor House by how much documentation there is with these records. Um, there's the outdoor allowances. Uh, maybe someone was just you know, in a tough financial situation. They didn't necessarily need to go to the county poor house. Maybe they just needed some financial assistance so the poor house would give them you know, a monthly stipend of, you know, a dollar or something like that. Those are outdoor allowances. Uh, bound apprentices, if there was uh, a child who came into the poor house, instead of, you know, keeping the, this poor child um, in a community poor house with a lot of other individuals, um, they would send them out to a respected miller or a respected blacksmith or a respected farmer so they can learn a trade. Um, examination books. Sometimes, um, you know, there was a dispute over, you know, where this individual resided. Did they live in Westchester or did they live in West Goshen? Um, so then they would have to have an examination of this pauper just to get a full life narrative of this individual so they can understand who's responsible uh, for paying their, their maintenance. Um, and also, I should preface, even though we don't have any pauper records, before 1798, sometimes individual townships would argue in front of the county court who was responsible for paying for their um, uh, individual paupers, right? So maybe township A thought township B should be the one paying for the paupers uh, maintenance. So they would go to a county court. Uh, then that's creating a court record. So that's a county record. And we do have those type of records. 
Um, in Pennsylvania in 1810, there was the Poor School, School Children Act. I forget the exact name of it, but basically anytime the tax collector went around collecting taxes, he would take the names of children whose parents couldn't afford schooling. Uh, so then they would take the names of this, the child, how old they were, and who their parents were, and then the, the tax collector would return that list of names to the county commissioners, who then would pay for those individuals, the schooling for those individuals. Um, about 1834, that's when there was a, a state law uh, for free public education, which doesn't make the this, this process relevant anymore. Uh, but for a short window of time, you get some really good genealogical information um, in the tax records. Again, you're going to get the name of this, the poor school child, their parents, and, and their age. And also tax discounts, right? So if someone was charged a certain tax, but they couldn't afford it, they would make or present their case to the county commissioners saying why they couldn't afford the tax. Um, so yes, we have wills, but it's important to reckon, or recognize, again, overwhelming majority of people didn't have a will. Uh, so we also have pauper records. Again, most people weren't that poor, uh, but it's a, it's a really nice representation of both extreme ends of the spectrum. Uh, that's the great thing about county government records, right? Um, everyone is represented. If, if you lived in a county, you're going to, anytime you interact with the county government, you're creating a paper trail. Really rich people always interact with the, the county government as well as really poor individuals, right? So it, it gets that whole spectrum of individuals. We also have court records. That should be no surprise. Um, everything before about 1710 is grouped under one court. Uh, so you're going to have criminal records as well as civil court records uh, between 1681 and 1710. 1681 is actually before there was a county or Chester County. Um, it was basically called the Upland Court. Uh, so it was an ex extension of uh, the Duke of York. It, it gets confusing, uh, but it's a really interesting docket because it started before Chester County was actually um, a county government. Um, 1710, that's when you get the division of the Court of Common Pleas and general quarter sessions. Quarter sessions, that's just basically the criminal court. So that's going to be the court responsible for, for hearing criminal matters. Um, criminal records are probably my favorite record just because it, they really humanize uh, the individual you're researching, right? Uh, people get in trouble. That's, 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 that's true in 2021. That's true in 1700. People make mistakes, people get in trouble, your criminal records are gonna show that. Um, one time I was researching an individual, he was a very prominent individual, he was a captain during the Revolutionary War, he was a very prominent figure with all of his neighbors, he was, every will that was filed during his lifetime, it seemed like he was the executor, he was signing deeds every other month, it seemed like, he was a real presence in the local community. Um, I just uh, punched his name in our database for criminal records and turned out um, as like a 16 year old kid, he got charged for fornication and bastardy, right? So he had um, a child out of wedlock. Um, so it's just interesting to see, okay, he was such a young kid. Did this have like a really impact or a big impact on his life that he kind of turned it around and then he became a leading presence in his local community. So um, I just, I, again, I think they just humanized the, the human experience. So um, we all have those what, skeletons in the closet, uh, but again, how, how bad is an assault? Like, people always get in trouble, so it's always worth uh, poking around the criminal records. And it's also important to know um, the, the court of quarter sessions, it also heard it was an administrative court, so it's going to do things like lay out roads and file tavern petitions. Um, so people a lot of people will come to us asking for indentured servitude records. They say, hey, my ancestor was an indentured servant in Chester County. What information do you have on them? Unfortunately, um, indentured servitude was a business agreement, right? Someone agreed to work for another person for a certain period of time. That's a business transaction. There's no government involvement in that, or traditionally, all right? There was a, there was a short window of time where Philadelphia County was recording this information, but there was no you know, state law mandating the, the recording of indentured servant agreements. So unfortunately, you're not gonna find a lot of indentured servant records in county governments here or county archives here in 
southeastern Pennsylvania or Pennsylvania in general, the only time you're going to have indentured servant records is if there was a reason to come to court, right? So maybe the master wanted to complain that his indentured servant ran off or wasn't, you know, performing his duties well. Maybe the servant wanted to take his master to court for not paying his freedom dues or things like that. So if there was a reason to come to the county court, then we should have a court record for that. But typically we're not gonna have um, indentured servant records. You're gonna wanna check. Uh, I think the Historical Society of Pennsylvania has some, and I know for a fact uh, the American Philosophical Society also in Philadelphia has uh, indentured servant records. And again, I talked about uh, the, the court of quarter sessions. Traditionally, that has been the administrative county court. Um, so that's when you're going to get tavern petitions. Um, the early 20th century, uh, that's when the county or the state started making people applying for tavern petitions to give a little bit biographical information. So you're going to get the person's, you know, where they were born, where they live, how old they are. That's really useful. Um, peddlers petitions. So if they want if someone wants to come to town to sell goods, they had to have a petition to do that. That was going to be filed with the court of quarter sessions, bridge papers, road papers, um, all your bureaucratic paperwork uh, we, we have here. Military records, uh, that really wasn't in Pennsylvania, typically wasn't a function of the county government. Most military records are going to be with the state archives in Harrisburg, because traditionally that has been a function of the state. We do have a collection called the Board of Relief. So during the Civil War, the county was paying uh, families whose, whose sons, whose husbands went off to war. These families could apply for you know, financial assistance. They're saying, hey, our son, our, our husband, our father, they're all fighting. We can't you know, work the field. We can't make the consistent income that we work. We need help, so the county would, would help them with some financial assistance. Uh, that was known as the Board of Relief. So that's a, somewhat a military record, right? Because you're, you're going to get information about um, the male, the male's military service. You're going to get what company they were in, um, their their regiment, things like that. And then we also have Revolutionary War pensions. Um, so there was a national or a federal law to issue Revolutionary War pensions, and those had to be filed with the local county government. So the people in Chester County were coming to county courts to apply for Revolutionary War pension records. Um, I know that was a lot to cover in a very short period of time. Probably wasn't the most uh, you know, clearly communicated presentation. But again, I just wanna emphasize the fact that to visit our website, our, um, our email address is going to be listed there. Um, again, this is where you're going to find our, our records and our indexes. So if you go to our website and you know your ancestor lived in Chester County during the Revolutionary War, you can go to the guides, go to those tax records. We know we want the 18th century tax records, for example. Let's say their last name is Graves. I was just researching a Graves. So you just you know follow the, the index that you want access to. And then we create PDFs. I know some, some archives you, you punch in the name. Um, that gets, anytime they update the website, that those systems have to be updated too. So we what we do here at Chester County, we create PDFs. Um, so you can just search through them uh, physically. So again, if I'm looking for someone with last names Graves, what I can do is just do a control F. Um, so here are people with the last name Graves. You see the year. And then if you want copies of these, what we always recommend is people doing is coming up with a list and then just giving us that reference information, that book number or that book, that page number. So we can um, you know, give them costs um, and instructions for getting, getting copies. I will tell you, um, just like COVID has changed everyone's lives, right? Um, now these genealogy lectures are all online. That that seems to be a net positive. We, because we see how much research people are doing from home nowadays, we have every intention by the end of the year to get every single record that we have digitized, which is a really good chunk 
of our records, we plan on getting them all up on our website. So right now we just have the indexes, but hopefully by the end of this year, you can access all of our tax records, all of our wills, all of our deeds. Um, again, I probably say, I don't want to give a number, but we have a really good bit of our collections already digitized. So if you come to our research room, you're not handling the physical records, you're going to look at them on a computer. What we're going to do is basically take those scanned images and put them right there on our website. Um, so we, again, we hope to have that by the end of the year. Um, not only do you have the indexes, um, you're also going to have, again, the helpful links, useful maps there. There's going to be a link to the Recorder of Deeds website to get the access to the deeds. Again, every single one from 1688 through 2021. Regularly, we're posting videos, we're making YouTube videos. We're writing blog posts. We're doing a lot of mapping. We are very big on GIS mapping in this department. Again, I think that's an extension of land being so important here. So we have a lot of cool mapping projects. One of them being this 1777 property atlas that we created. Um, so if you know you have an ancestor who lived in Chester County during the 1770s, I recommend checking this out. You'll see that not every township has been um, researched yet. And that's just because there's only two of us working on it right now, but we have every intention of doing the entire county. Um, so you just see, a, you can get a list of the individual. So remember I was looking for that individual graves. So what we can do is we can open the table here at the bottom, go to the owners, sort by the name, and then just look for the individual. If it's your ancestor, a research subject, um, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So free this to work, it's basically reading whatever is on the screen right now. So I just have to be zoomed out so that all the, the municipalities are showing. Um, but yeah, then you just click on the individual and it'll take you right in. So, you know, again, if you know you have ancestors in this area, you can basically know exactly where they were living. If you ever come to Chester County, uh, you can maybe go out there and check it out. So um, definitely go on over and check out our website. Um, our emails are there if you have any questions. So I know that was a lot. Um, happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Okay, so at this time, I'll, I'll go ahead and open it up to the class. If you'd like to ask um, John a question, uh, please do not turn on your camera, uh, just turn on your microphone and we'll go ahead and, and start answering the questions. I have a question. Hi, Marlene. Uh, I have an ancestor. I have an ancestor that lived in Crane Hook, in uh, what is now Delaware, between 1663 and let's say 1700. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering if any of the documents, like deeds or whatever, might have been um, recorded in Chester County. Mm -hmm. I'm really yeah. looking for his signature because there are two men with similar names and I think they're the same man. Okay. Um, so you had two things there. Um, so 1660s, you said, that's before um, it was an English colony, right? So at that point, it's still a Dutch colony. So anything before <laughs> English colonization is going to be, I think it's with the New York Public Library um, or it's still going to be with the country of origin, right? So maybe the Netherlands. 1663, 1664, 1664 is when it became an English colony. Um, so you might want to check in a few other, or again, New York, New York Public Library, the country of origin. Uh, basically county governments, they're only going to start when they were formed. So again, Chester County formed in 1681. So we're not going to have any, or excuse me, 1682, we're not going to have any records before that time period. Um, even though your ancestor lived in what is today Delaware County, at the time they would have filed those papers with Chester County. So we will have those records. Um, so I'm not sure if you looked for him in our indexes, um, but again, if he had wills, if he had deeds, if he went to court, um, because he was interacting with Chester County, uh, there should be some paper trail of him uh, within our records. Okay, I'll check. It never occurred to me to look in uh, Pennsylvania. I've tried uh, Delaware and I've tried the 
New Netherlands project okay. already. Yep. So thank you for that hint. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Go ahead and unmute, unmute your microphone. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I want to let everyone know that I just put about, I don't know, about 20 minutes ago, I put today's uh, PowerPoint presentation from our guest speaker into the chat box. So once again, uh, before you leave today, if you are interested in, in grabbing all that information, not only about uh, the copy for today's presentation in, uh, I believe it's PowerPoint, isn't it, John? Um, I sent you the PDF slides. Yeah. Oh, PDF slides. Okay. So it's a PDF format. Okay. Yep. So uh, those are all in the chat box now, as well as all the links that I talked about at the beginning of class today. Uh, while we're waiting for other questions to come in, John, I had a couple records. You talked about the, the, uh, the wheat records or the wheat that was going out of the area uh, into, um, into the slave areas. Are there records of those farmers who grew the wheat? Yeah, so um, over at the Chester County History Center, so again, our like sister organization, they, they have a really expansive collection of account books, ledgers. So you have these farmers who would have documented every single penny that was coming in and going out. And they're selling a lot of, um, a lot of bales of flour, a lot of rum to the Caribbean. And they're qu constantly going, making trips to the Caribbean um, to you know, establish business partners. Uh, so again, they have uh, they have farms, they have wheat, they want uh, a customer for their product. So a lot of business ac activity was happening here. Um, again, because that's a business record, we don't have anything here in our records, but because we have that really interesting relationship with the Chester County History Center, we know if we can go over there and look at those ledgers and account books. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, on the vital record slide, um, you talked about the alternative records. Like, for instance, I, I wrote down two corners records in Poorhouse. Mm -hmm. um, do you have those records too, the alternative records? Oh, yeah. Yep. All those, um, again, all those county records of so those Poorhouse records. Uh, we certainly have the coroner's records. We have, I forget when they start, I want to say like 1710 through 1957. Uh, the coroner's was basically gonna come out anytime there was a sudden or unexpected death. So if someone just died of old age, obviously there's not gonna be a coroner's report. Um, but if you know, if, if you have an ancestor who died very young, it might be worth you know, taking, taking a few minutes to look at those coroner's records to see, to see if something happened. And are those coroner's records indexed on your website? Uh, yes, I believe we have through 1957. So yep, 1720, through 1957, all has been indexed. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, and then, um, oh, you talked about, uh, I think it was C Cecil County in Maryland. So that was basically your local Gretna Green then. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, you're, you were talking about how a lot of people went to Cecil County, Maryland to get married. Mm -hmm. So I was just commenting that that's your local Gretna Green. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Um, again, the tri-state area here, Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, if you were younger than 21 and wanted to get married, you had to get your, your parents to consent. Uh, some young couples didn't want to wait, didn't think their parents would support it, so they went to Maryland, uh, where you just had to be 16 years old. You didn't have to have your, your parental consent. Uh, so it, it happens quite often where my ancestor, I know they were married here in Chester County, but then they look over in Cecil County and that's where they find them no real direct association with, with Maryland or Cecil County, uh, but it, it's really close and it was uh, an, easy, an easier way to get married for young couples. Wonderful, okay. Now, um, we talked about the supplies tax uh, that, D, that people who wanna join DER or SAR, uh, if they don't have a, uh, a, a, um, an ancestor who was actually uh, in service uh, fighting for the cause, this is a great, I'm so glad you brought that up because we've talked briefly in the past about how there are other means to qualify an ancestor for membership in the DER and the SAR. Yeah, I'm, I don't know the stipulations enough, but we have enough um, applicants coming in and they, they know the process well, they explain it to us. Um, and yeah, again, if they're just paying that federal or state supplies tax. So literally your, am, your ancestor, could have paid a tax in 17, a head tax in 1778, right? 
Maybe they didn't own a single acre of land, but because they were older than 21, they paid a head tax. So that's some form of support for the war. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, let's see here. Now, my next question was, how do you get to the page number for the deeds when you uh, contact the land records office? Because you said you needed the page number. Yep. So for, let's say you want, you know, a deed from 1800. Um, first, you're going to need the reference information. So you're going to need the book and you're going to need the page number. Now, there's two ways to get it. Um, I'll go back to that slide real quick. Let's see. So if you want uh, a deed that was filed before 1865, we have them indexed on our website. Unfortunately, we have not indexed um, them after, after 1865. So you're gonna need to consult the, the physical office books. Luckily, they've been digitized and they're available on uh, FamilySearch. FamilySearch, you just need a free account. Uh, so sign up for FamilySearch, search for Chester County uh, Recorder of Deed books and you'll find them. Um, that's basically everything. 1688 through 1918, it's a little clunky to use, uh, but if you're looking for a deed from you know, 1880, let's say this is a really good option. Or of course, if you're coming down to visit us, you can access the deed book or the indexes in our research room. But let's say again, you want that deed from 1800, just go to our website and our records section. It's gonna be under land records, deed books, and again, same system. You're just going to look for the last name of the individual you're looking for. Let's let's um let's take this one for example. We want D book A5, page 88. A588. And on that same page where you access the, the indexes, if you go to accessing deeds, there's going to be a link to the recorder of deeds website. You want the IQS search. If you just read this, it'll, it'll give you a description of that. So I'm just gonna fly through it right now. Just open up that IQS search and you're gonna sign in as, as a guest. And then you're gonna type in A5. And I forget the page number, but we'll just do something random. You'll notice these, these are really good for research purposes, right? You're gonna be able to access them. The quality, not the greatest, right? Because what they're doing is they're just digitizing old microfilm. Um, if you want, you know, higher resolution scans of the deed, you can come to us. Um, and again, we'll give you a quote for, for copies. But again, we have every intention of getting all of our digitized materials up on our website by the end of the year, um, which we have our deed book scan. So by the end of the year, hopefully you'll be able to get, you know, better quality scans than this. But for research purposes, they're great. You're going to get all the information right there. Could you do that one more time? Go through that process. Yeah, sure thing. So again, let's say um, you're on our website. You're going to access the records, guides, and indexes. Deeds are going to be under land records. You can go to the deeds. When you open up this page, is automatically going to open up to the indexes. This is how you're going to find the reference information. So again, maybe you're starting off blank. You just want to look to see if your ancestor owned any land in Chester County. You're first going to want to access the indexes. Once you have the book and page number, go to accessing deeds. You're going to access uh, this link at the bottom here. You can also access um, deed books on Family Search. Family Search, a little clunky. Um, but you can access them there as well. But if we're just doing the recorder of deeds. Let's open that up. IQS. No need to make an account. We're just going to do it as a guest. And this is where you're going to plug in your number. Um, a lot of times what you're going to see is you're going to see a deed book reference like H-6 or something like that. You don't want to use a dash in this system. You're just going to do the, the letter followed by the number. Hit enter. When you hit enter, that's going to load the film. And then just type in your page number. Um, as I'm sure you all know, it's really important when you want page number, you want the physical page number, right? So if we want page 500 uh, and we put 500, we just want to make sure the number we put in matches the, the physical book. This one doesn't. So we'll just skip ahead four pages um, to get to 500. 
to. I know it's not the easiest system to use, um, right? They're not really creating the system for um, historical researchers like us. They're using it for um, business and legal purposes. But you know, for right now, it, it, it's a great resource to have. It's not a great alternative, right? And we like free. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, uh, class, do you have any other questions? Um, you, John, there is, I, I did have two people say for some reason they can't open up the PDF uh, file that you sent of your presentation. Would okay. it be possible for you to resend it to me in like PowerPoint or something? Sure, yeah, I can try another uh, method, yeah. Okay, if, if the file's too large, um, maybe you can put it on your Google Drive and share it with me? Sure, yep, yeah, I can do that too. Okay, great, yeah, because I had two people uh, send me a private message in the chat box saying they couldn't open it. Okay, interesting. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Uh, let's see here. Let me just make sure I, I got all my list of questions answered. Let's see here. All right, just wanted to remind everybody if you want to download that chat box or if you can't figure out how to download it, you just click on those three little dots in the chat box. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you can always just highlight everything in the chat box and copy and paste it into an email to yourself, whichever is more convenient. And I'm just giving it a few, we're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat box, John. Some people are saying that oh, got an amazing presentation. That's what Betty says. So uh, a lot of thank yous. And uh, let's see here, just giving the class a few more moments. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll stop the recording right now, but before I do, uh, I want to invite the class uh, to stay. We have another hour or so of class after this. Uh, if you're new, like uh, I think it was Mark who was new here today for the first time, uh, the first hour of class or so is our guest speaker, and the second hour of class we work on our family trees as a group. Uh, so if you'd like to stay after, uh, please feel free to do so. And if you do not, then if you'd like, you can log off. But I hope you will stay with us at least for a few minutes uh, because I will be sharing uh, in just a few moments here, I'll be sharing pictures of our new dedicated genealogy research room on the TMCC campus. So uh, with that, John, I will say thank you very much. And if you'd like to log out, uh, John, all you have to do is click on that red end button. And uh, once again, we'll say thank you for letting us record today. And I'll be sending you the link to the recording on our YouTube channel in a few more weeks. Great. Thank you, everyone. And please reach out with your questions. We're happy to help. Thank you, John. Take care, everyone.